Wow. Good morning, church. Welcome to the house of the Lord, the St. Philip Lutheran Church here in Raleigh, North Carolina, for our service of worship and praise this Sunday morning. This is RIC Sunday in the life of our congregation. RIC stands for Reconciling in Christ, and it is that annual occasion when we join with almost 1,000 other ELCA congregations around this nation in the inclusion of, the affirmation of, and advocacy for our LGBTQ family and friends, recognizing that we are all created in the image of God. We are delighted that you have chosen to worship with us here this morning, either in person or online. Uh, we are blessed by your presence and your participation in today's worship service. And finally, we thank you, as always, for your continued financial support of our mission and ministry here at St. Philip. Uh, put quite simply, we could not do it without you, and we never, ever take that for granted. You may continue to give here in person, obviously, through the mail or via our church website, which is www.stphilip.org. That's st-philip.org. At this time, uh, we ask you to please rise for the Thanksgiving for baptism. For those of you online, I will be off the screen because our baptism font is located in the back. And it occurs to us that we do not have a camera yet that can capture that. Uh, but our unity as Christians uh, is in baptism. So we ask that you please turn and face the baptismal font for the Thanksgiving for baptism. Lord, you call us through the waters of baptism to be our authentic selves. You call us holy 
and set us on a path to manifest your kingdom here on earth, let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, fountain of living water, who is the source of breath and nourishment. Amen. Amen. We praise you for the waters of life, for the streams and oceans, lakes and estuaries, and for the rain and snow that gives life to every living thing. From the waters above and the waters below, you made sacred our bond with water. Through the waters of the flood and the parting of the seas, you showed your promises to be true. In the waters of baptism, you claimed us and called each of us by our true name. Through baptism into the body of Christ, you transformed our lives and made us whole. Send now your spirit to move in our midst and soak us with your gifts of mercy, love, and grace. Amen. Amen. And now for the brief order of confession and forgiveness of sin. In the name of the Holy Parent, and of the Child, and of the Holy Spirit, ever present in our lives. Amen. Amen. Your people, Lord, long to feel seen, named, and cared for. The church has excluded and pushed away people, calling them other and different, and waits for those harmed to lead the work of reconciliation. Today we worship with open hearts and minds, readying ourselves for the holy ministry of justice and equity work. As your people, we know you are with us and that your Holy Spirit makes reconciliation possible. Amen. Amen. As we learn how to make the church a safer place, we trust in the Spirit's guidance as we seek to be an advocate for our LGBTQ siblings and all who are told that they are other. We trust in the Spirit's guidance. It is with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the grace of Jesus, that we confess and ask for forgiveness. We proclaim with joy and love that people of all sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions matter, that black indigenous, and people of color matter, that neurodiversity and differing abilities of bodies are sacred, and that we as a church stand firmly against racism, homophobia, transphobia, and any other sin that makes people feel less than because of who God lovingly made them to be. We commit our words and our actions to be ones of advocacy for all of the people in your kingdom, Lord. Holy Creator, we celebrate your boundless diversity and see the ways that we are made in your image. Amen. Amen. Our gathering hymn this morning is When We Gather. Uh, it's come to my attention that there may be a, a phrase or refrain left out accidentally in the words in your bulletin. Uh, so mostly follow the bulletin, but mainly follow the singers and the band and the choir. Amen. <coughs>
now may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love, mercy, and justice of God, and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Loving Creator, you knit us together and created our innermost beings. You created us loved, worthy, and unique. You created us equally as your children. Help us to find our wholeness in you and live into our divinely inspired purpose. Guide us to unfold your story of love. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of God's holy word. The first reading is from the sixth chapter of Micah. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Baim son of Beor answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. 
the 139th Psalm read responsibly. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my life. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You have me in, the eye and the and lay your hand upon Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. For it will be you who form my inward parts. You knit me together. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you, when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, in order that, as it is written, that the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. According to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter, beginning with the first verse. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, 
for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That is the good news. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The message. All right, good morning, everyone. Okay, so this morning I have, a new, I have a question for you. Do any of you have any pets at home? Raise your hand if you have a pet at home. Do any of you have cats or dogs? Yeah? What kind of animals do you have? I have a dog. You have a dog? I have a dog and I'm going to get my own pet fish soon. Oh, you have a dog and you're going to get a pet fish soon? That's pretty cool. You have a cat? Nice. So today, the reason I'm asking is that, do you think your, your pets love you? Yeah, how do you know? They want to play with you? They want to play with you? Yeah, that's a good way to tell. How else, how else do you know your pets love you? Give them a treat. Oh, when you give them a treat? Do they act happy when you give them a treat? Yeah. That they like. Oh, so when you play, yeah, so when you play with them, so when you play with balls and other things, your, your pets like that? Yeah, so do you think that there are certain times that your pets love you more than other times? You kind of look at me like, I don't know. Well, I, the reason I bring that up is because my dog, her name is Google. She's a golden doodle dog. And she seems to really love me a, a whole lot more whenever I'm eating food. <laughs> because she will sit really close to me and look at me very, very attentively because I think she wants to make sure I chew my food really well so that I don't choke. <laughs> do you think that's why she's, she, she loves me? Why do you think she loves me more then? She probably wants the food? Mm, maybe. So that's interesting. Cause so, so what I'm hearing you say is that my dog seems to love me more when there's food involved because she wants to participate in eating that same food that I'm eating. Yeah? So she wants to do the same thing that I'm doing. If I'm eating food, she wants to eat food too? Yeah? Well, I think, I want you to keep that in mind because I do think our dogs really, really love food. Our pets love snacks and, and treats and things. And I think that they love us just a little bit more maybe, or at least they seem to love us a little bit more whenever they get those treats and that food. So keep that in mind because, you know, it's interesting that my dog likes me more when she's wanting the exact same thing that I want. Because it's a lot like what we hear in our gospel story today. So in today's gospel story, we hear, that Jesus, we hear Jesus say that certain people are blessed so now the word blessed can mean a couple different things. But one thing that we know it definitely means is that God is really, that when we're blessed, it means that God is really close to us. So Jesus then lists some people that are blessed or really close to God. And I think that one thing that all of these people that he lists have in common is that they all want something that God also wants. Kind of like how our pets love us a little bit more when they want something that we want. So, for instance, Jesus says that the peacemakers want peace, just like God wants peace. And the merciful want mercy, just like God does. And then there are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, 
just like God does. So we know that God is with us all of the time, right? Right? Yeah, we do. So we know that God is with us all the time. But in today's scripture passage, Jesus is reminding us that when we are wanting the same things that God is wanting for us and the world, that we can know that God is extra close with us in those moments. So, and the more that we know about how God is with us, the better that we're then able to go out and receive God's help to make things uh, like, the, like those things happen in the world that both God wants and that we want. So things like making people who are often left off to the side and not included in things feel more welcome. God wants that, and we want that too. And when we want that, we know that God is closer to us in those moments. And that is our good news today. And I'd like to end with a prayer and love to invite you to repeat after me and invite the congregation to join as well. Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God. thank you for Jesus. Help us, to remember Help us to remember that when we want the same things as you, for the world around us, that we can count on you to be extra close to us. Kind of like our pets. We love you. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up, everybody. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day, this opportunity to worship you once again in spirit and in truth. We thank you for the gift of each other, this assembly, the opportunity to share our lives with one another. We ask on this day especially uh, that you would grant us grace to always be mindful of our LGBTQ siblings. Uh, to always defend them, speak up for them, advocate for them, uh, love them in a world that often does none of the above. We ask that you would give us a spirit of love, grace, and mercy in all things, with all people and at all times. Our hearts are heavy in this nation this week with what we have seen and heard. We are amazed, actually, at our ability as humanity to be cruel to one another and to hate one another, to bludgeon one another, to kill one another. And yet here we are in worship, coming once again to seek you, the fountain of all grace and mercy and guidance in our lives. Uh, we are sorry for all the abuse of power, the acts of violence that we perpetrate against one another. And now we focus not only on those most egregious aspects uh, that we can all witness on the news, but we turn the mirror on ourselves and we look inward into our own hearts. We ask that you would root up those places of judgment and criticism and anger and wrath. Uh, all those occasions when we speak harshly to one another and think uncharitable thoughts of one another. Uh, we know that comes not from you, but from our own fallen sinful nature. So we ask that you would convert our hearts, that you would change us, that you would soften us, that you would grant us empathy and compassion for ourselves and for all other human beings. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our sermon text for today is the Gospel lesson, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. It's the very beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, what's known as the Beatitudes. My sermon title for today is Right Here, Right Now. Right Here, Right Now. 
These Beatitudes begin the first and greatest of five large discourses of Jesus found herein in Matthew's Gospel. Indeed, they begin Jesus' most famous sermon and teaching of all, namely the Sermon on the Mount. This sermon opens in verse number one with Jesus being portrayed as the new Moses, going up on a mountain and receiving God's word and will for God's people. Rather than going up Mount Sinai, however, and receiving the Ten Commandments, Jesus goes up an unnamed mountain in Galilee and proclaims the eight Beatitudes. Can you turn me down just a tad in the mic? I don't know if y'all, it just sounds like I'm a little loud. Don't turn me all the way down. I still want to be heard. <laughs> Thank you. These Beatitudes, so-called because they are blessings, serve to inaugurate the new age of God's kingdom that Jesus has come both to proclaim and to embody. When Jesus saw the crowds, verse 1 opens, He went up the mountain, again like a new and greater Moses, and after He sat down, a normal teaching position for a rabbi, His disciples came to Him. Then He began to speak and taught them, saying... This sermon, which includes many of Jesus' most famous teachings, lasts three entire chapters and concludes at the very end of chapter 7 with this remark. Now when Jesus had finished all these sayings, the crowds were astonished at His teaching, for He taught them as one having authority, and not as their scribes. Something about these words, you see, really resonates with the human condition. There's no real parallel text in either Mark or John's Gospel, but there is one in Luke's Gospel, in the sixth chapter therein. Therein it is referred to, ironically, as the Sermon on the Plain, since Jesus delivers it not from a mountain, but rather from a level place. Luke begins with a form or a version of these Beatitudes, but there are fewer of them, four rather than eight. They are differently ordered. They are personalized. Blessed are you poor, rather than Matthew's impersonalized, blessed are the poor. They are practical and concrete in Luke's gospel. Blessed are you poor. Blessed are you that hunger now, as opposed to Matthew's more spiritualized version. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And there is also an accompanying and offsetting list of woes in Luke's version that Matthew lacks. Woe to you that are rich, full, laugh, etc. In an interesting and curious observation, someone once noticed the constant controversy and brouhaha surrounding attempts at posting the Ten Commandments in public places, but no one ever seems to attempt to post these eight Beatitudes, which can be viewed as the equivalent Christian teaching of the Jewish law. The opening words of Jesus, which constitute the Beatitudes, which began His Sermon on the Mount, and which effectively summarized the kingdom God desires, could not have more weight, gravity, and import. If you count the Beatitudes yourself, you may count nine rather than the traditional eight, based on the number of times Jesus begins a sentence with the word blessed. But most scholars and commentators take the ninth blessing, found in verses 11 and 12, to really be just an elaboration on the eighth blessing. In verse number 10, each of these eight Beatitudes or blessings could be an entire sermon unto itself. So today simply has to serve as a brief overview, a survey of sorts. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's a fascinating starting point, isn't it? If most of us were writing this today, we'd be tempted to proclaim, Blessed are the rich in spirit, because we seek to be spiritually rich, filled, saturated. No one seeks to be spiritually poor, I don't think. My suspicion is that to be poor means that you lack something. So in order to receive Jesus or the blessings of God's kingdom, we must lack precisely those things. You must be empty 
at a certain level in order to be filled. In order, I think, for one to be made whole, one has to acknowledge truthfully exactly how broken one is. It is incumbent upon us to recognize our own spiritual poverty, emptiness, and sinfulness before we can truly receive and be filled with the goodness of God's abundance and meaning and forgiveness. Blessed are those who mourn, Jesus continues, for they will be comforted. To mourn is to lament, to be sorrowful, to be in great pain or anguish, to experience loss or grief. It is a horrible place to be when life is devoid of joy. Jesus promises here a future reversal of such a sad situation. He will take a person or a situation which is inconsolable and heal it of our various enemies in this life, the Bible testifies that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And that one day, through Jesus Christ, death will be swallowed up in victory. Every tear will be wiped away. Death will lose its victory. Death will give up its sting, which seems so powerful right now. And oh, what a great day that will be. Blessed are the meek, he states, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek are those who are humble, who, as Scripture says, count others more worthy than themselves. They are quiet, lowly, unassuming, often overlooked, flying under the radar screen. They don't start stuff. They don't stir the pot. They are not doormats, however, lacking in self-worth or self-esteem, but they have an honest assessment of the bigger picture and their place in the overall scheme of things. Among all of Jesus' counterintuitive and countercultural teachings, this one may be the most difficult to heed or achieve since the world and society tend to operate based on the law of the jungle, where only the strong survive. So it is critical for us as Christians to perhaps redefine strength, taking into account God's desire that we be meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. We hunger and thirst for many, many things in this life, my friends, but is righteousness among them? We hunger and thirst for love and acceptance, for meaning and significance, for success and acclaim, for wealth and possessions, for happiness and contentment, for security and stability, for popularity and fame. But how about righteousness being fundamentally in right relationship with the God of the universe who created us in God's own image and after God's own likeness and called us according to God's good purpose. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. In this instance, and in a good way, you reap what you sow comes around, goes around. That's what the Lord's prayer encourages when we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Parable after parable, teaching after teaching, encourages us to exhibit mercy to other people, not in theory, So we ourselves have constantly, as we ourselves, have constantly been recipients of God's mercy. What others say about you 
that you are merciful in your dealings with others. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Purity here means freedom from mixed motives, having no hidden agenda, not two-faced. Those who are pure in heart have a single solitary focus. How can I show love? How can I be faithful? How can I serve God and others? They seem to have a fundamental orientation towards love and holiness and other human beings. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Children of God here are defined as those who make peace. That is unity, harmony, oneness, wholeness, togetherness, fellowship. The opposite, of course, is strife, contention, division, separation, violence. When Paul later admonishes the Corinthians for disorder in worship and in their communal life together, he writes, For God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. Are you a peacemaker? Is that how those who know you best would describe you? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The remaining verses, again, simply elaborate on this last beatitude. And blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil falsely against you on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Just as these verses are a cautionary corrective on the human desire to be liked and accepted, oftentimes sidestepping justice in order to be popular, they also serve as an amendment to those who take perverse pride in persecution. The persecution herein is for righteousness' sake and on Jesus' account, not for personal reasons having more to do with pride and ego. As always, we allow the total scriptural word to challenge us. Are we, as a congregation and as individuals, poor in spirit, mournful, meek, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, persecuted for righteousness' sake? Would others experience us as such and describe us thusly? Or are we short-tempered, quick to yell and be angry, self-centered and uncooperative, judgmental, thinking that we know best. If you're anything like me, you may know in your conscience where you seem to match up well on this list, and also perhaps where you are challenged to grow in integrity. It has been said very accurately, I think, that the gospel message in total afflicts the comfortable and comforts the afflicted. Allow me to say that again. The gospel of Jesus Christ afflicts the comfortable and comforts the afflicted. And perhaps nowhere is that more true than in these opening eight Beatitudes. In your affliction, 
allow them to comfort you. But in your comfort, allow them to challenge you, to shake things up, if not outright afflict you. But know that all of the above is done within the context and in the reality of your free salvation, entire forgiveness, redemption, and unconditional and eternal love that God has for you through God's Son, Jesus Christ. Lastly, I would like to call your attention to the bookends of these Beatitudes, numbers 1 and 8, respectively, found in verses 3 and 10. Notice, notice, if you will, two things. First, unlike the intermediate ones, they conclude the same way. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Everything in between has a different outcome or reward or consequence, if you will. But they are bookended, they are bracketed by, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Secondly, and very tellingly, I might add, the verb tenses are different in the middle six Beatitudes than in the surrounding two bookends. In the middle six, the verb tenses are all future, indicating their bestowal, their fulfillment in a time yet to come. Will be comforted, will inherit the earth, will be filled, will receive mercy, will see God, will be called children of God. In other words, all the pain you are enduring right now in your life will be ended one day. All the trying to do the right things, all the trying to live the right way will be vindicated one day. It will all have been worth it one day in an as yet unrealized future. And that's comforting, that's reassuring, because that's part of God's sure and certain promises. But it's also important to note that the bookends of verses 3 and 10, Beatitudes numbers 1 and 8, that bracket the whole thing are not in the future tense, but rather in the present. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For ours is the kingdom of heaven. Do you understand what that means, my friends? God's kingdom is not only in the future, it's also in the present. It's not only by and by, it's also here and now. It's not only pie in the sky, but it's also that sweet slice of pie that you will eat for dessert later on today as you break bread with your family. The same Jesus that said there will be wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes and famines, distress to herald God's incoming kingdom in the last days, in the future... It's the same Jesus that said in another place, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, but rather the kingdom of God is in the very midst of you. So it's not a matter of either or, but both and. The kingdom of God is not future or present. It's both future and present. We tend to emphasize the future unrealized facets of God's kingdom. But Jesus in the Beatitudes surrounds and brackets the future facets with the present reality, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven consists of the air you're breathing and the blood that's circulating inside you right now. It consists in the fact that God is providing enough food, water, clothing, and shelter in your life right now. It consists of the fact that you are sitting beside someone right now who loves you very much and who cares for you and wants more than anything for you to be well and may even give their life for yours if given that chance. Oh, Jesus has promised us that wherever two or three are gathered in His name, there He is in the midst of them. And we have many times those numbers in here this morning, my friends. So we have an overabundance, an embarrassment of riches of God's Spirit and God's presence and God's peace right now. Despite your pain and struggles and suffering that may only fully be healed one day in the future, yours is the kingdom of heaven right here, right now. You are blessed 
right here, right now. You are loved right here, right now. You are anointed of the Holy Spirit right here, right now. You are accepted for who you are, forgiven all your flaws right here, right now. You are loved and supported and encouraged and cherished and valued by your siblings in Christ in this very place right here and right now. Take heart. Be encouraged, be strengthened, for you are blessed right here, right now. And yours will be the kingdom of heaven one day. And it already is right here, right now. Blessed are you. Joel and Susan and Ilsa, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Walt and Karen, Inga, Debbie, Ed, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Bob and Ann, Mark and Joanne, Grace, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, John, Diane, Linda, Vicki, Jeff and Berta, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Dick and Sarah and Tom, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Janice, Stephen and Barbara, Blessed are you, Dan and Sylvia and Joe, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Laura. Blessed are you, Kathy and Paul, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Jim and Stacy, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Barbara, Ron, Dave and Betty, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Jim and Kenny, Jerry and Diane, Don and Julie, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Frank and Claire. Blessed are you, Dean, Emma, Aaron, John, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Martha, Damone, Nico, and Kaylun, <laughs> for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Mary Ellen, Bob, Mary Lee, Don, and Louise, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Howard. Bill and Gail, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Fernando and Carol. Blessed are you, Jason and Don, Marilyn and Patty, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Kathy, Linda, Vanessa, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Pam and Paul, Dawn, Emma, Julian, Blessed are you, Reagan, Bob, Waylon, Angela, Sully, Oliver, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Jean slash Mama, <laughs> Pat, Stephanie, Alan, Catherine, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Shelley and Carol. Blessed are you, Frank. Blessed are you, Mike. Blessed are you, Lois. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. Why? Thank you. And last but not least, you thought I forgot about you. Blessed are you, Catherine. <laughs> For yours is the kingdom of heaven. I did that because I read an article once that said we tend as preachers to preach about things. We preach about forgiveness. They say you can do that, but forgive your people. We preach about blessing. You can do that, but bless your people. Bless you, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. We ask that you rise now as we join together in singing our song, hymn of the day. God, we, what is it? What does it say? We <laughs> God, we gather as your people. Amen. I knew it began with God. I could have heard the rest.
Let us profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We, we believe, believe in, in one God, the architect and guardian, who in the beginning breathed life into the void, sprouting all that is seen and unseen. We believe in Jesus Christ, that in order to reconcile the cosmos, this God sent a piece of God's own self to be born human as kin to us all, and who at the hands of political tyranny was killed. He rose again to new life in love, to return the world to God. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who is one with the Creator and Savior. She is our guide and wisdom. She pours her spirit into apostles, prophets, teachers, healers, and listeners. We believe in the uniting of all Christians into the one body of Christ, and we believe in our return to God at the end. Amen. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. We pray for our pastors, deacons, bishops, and church leaders, that they may lead us to be a loving and welcoming community in Jesus Christ. We give thanks for reconciling works and all of our LGBTQ siblings. Merciful God, send wholeness to our church. We pray for change, for the dismantling of systems rooted in oppression and discrimination. Make us bold in our proclamation that the lives, loves, and gifts of all people matter to you, and so they matter to all of us, manifest in both word and deed. Teach us to see and celebrate the stunning beauty in all you have made. Merciful God, send wholeness to your people. We pray for the sustainability of our earthly home. Guide us to care for creation. Be mindful of waste, carbon emissions, and the impact of these sins on poor and marginalized communities. Merciful God. Send wholeness to our earth. We pray for our siblings all around the world. We pray that governments enact laws that protect and defend the poor, marginalized, and persecuted. We pray that your hand of justice intercedes for us. Merciful God. Send wholeness to the nations. We pray for those that have chaos swirling around them. We pray for those that have been told they are less than, wrong, or an outcast for who they are. We pray that all of us find our true peace and wholeness of ourselves in you. We pray for those that are victims of violence at the hands of homophobia, transphobia, racism, and ableism. We pray for your mercy, love, and healing to care for them. Merciful God. Send wholeness to your children. We pray that our faith community and its ministries uplift and care for all of your diverse created beings. We pray that we work towards justice and peace in our own family and community. Merciful God. Send wholeness to us. We pray for LGBTQ saints, all those who have gone before us in the fight for justice, freedom, and peace, those that have boldly stood as themselves, showing the substance you created even when the world told them to hide. Merciful God. Receive our saints in peace. God, we continue to pray for the families of the victims of mass shootings in our country and worldwide. We pray for the family and friends of Tyree Nichols in Memphis. We pray that anger, hatred, violence, and abuse of power would cease. We pray for conversion and softening of hearts and for love, joy, peace, and the rest of the fruit of the Spirit. We lift to you now the names of those for whom we have special concern, either silently or aloud, and ask for comfort, healing, and peace. Chuck, Cindy, Sally, Catherine.
power. Stacy. Merciful God, hear our prayers. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. Amen. As the family of St. Philip, we ask that you open our ears to hear your call for us and guide our feet in following. Help us to be good stewards of our time and treasure and to put our trust in you to provide. We ask for blessings on the life of our faith leaders and that your spirit guide us in relationship in ministry. We put our hope in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share a sign of God's peace with one another now, as well as those who are online via the back cameras and more personally at the front monitor. God's peace be with you. And his most famous sermon of all, the Sermon on the Mount, not to lay up for ourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. Rather, he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consume and these do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you have not already given online, we invite you to join with me now in making presentation of all of our tithes and offerings to the Lord via the offer plate in the back. We thank you so much.
God bless you. Voices of Praise Choir. Thank you so very much. Please rise as we join in our offertory. Let the vineyards be fruitful, Lord. Let us pray. God of all creation, you have given us life, love, compassion, and hope. We offer the gifts of our very beings to your holy calling. Strengthen us through these gifts to be the arms of mercy and justice for the world. Amen. We celebrate together now the Lord's Supper, the Feast of Holy Communion. And now may the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for you sent your child to be the light and life of the world. Through him, you showed us how to love and be loved, how to enact justice and pray for peace. And so with the glorious company of the saints, with earth and sea and stars, with the choirs of angels and all the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, just, and merciful God, in the intersection of the waters above and the waters below, you created life out of the void. We thank you for the gift of creation. Through Miriam and Moses, you led your people from oppression into liberation. We thank you for your gift of liberation. You sent the prophets to warn to love, not hate, and guide us to your faithfulness and your promises. We thank you for your promise to love. In the intersection of the divine and humanity, you made us whole through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of Christ. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
with this holy sustenance, we are made new creatures in the covenant of your Son, Jesus Christ. Together we remember his life, death, and resurrection in this meal and await a new and unending life in you. Come, Lord Jesus. Please send your spirit to this place, to this meal, and to your church. May her life-giving wisdom be upon us, now renewed and nourished in your holy promises to be creators of justice, wholeness, and freedom. Come, Holy Spirit, with the birds of the air and fish in the sea, with the flora and fauna, with saints of all time and space, we praise you always, O God, blessed Trinity, to the very end of the age. Amen. And now gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we now pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Be strong. Do not fear. Here is your God who has come to save you. Amen. You may be seated for the distribution. All are invited to. All are welcome at the Lord's table. Children are invited forward for a blessing. Please follow the directions in your bulletin and of the ushers.
Please rise to receive our post-communal blessing. And now may the eating of Christ's body and the drinking of His blood strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. Let us pray. Holy One, we thank you for the healing that springs forth abundantly from this table. Renew our strength to do justice, love kindness, and journey humbly with you. Amen. Partners in ministry, what is our calling? Jesus asks that we love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. Jesus tells us that a second is like it. We shall love our neighbors as ourselves. We answer that call and we go out to share the love of Christ. Amen. Please remain standing for just a couple of mission opportunities and announcements. Uh, number one, please stay for our annual congregational meeting, which is immediately following this worship service. This is the one time uh, per year when we gather and receive the reports of our church. That will be immediately following this worship service. And please stay, if you're able, for a light soup, lunch, and fellowship immediately following the meeting. I think that is happening in Luther Hall. Is that okay? So that will be in Luther Hall, the soup following the meeting. And as always, uh, on Wednesday is Pastor's Bible Study. Uh, we continue to journey through the book of Acts, 10.30 a.m. and 6.45 p.m. Are there any further announcements? If not, receive the benediction of our Lord. Siblings in Christ, let us go out into the world in peace. Take up the pledge to be an advocate for our LGBTQ siblings and all those in need of occlusion and advocacy, and leave this space with a fervent passion for welcome. Amen. Our sending hymn uh, is Together. Uh, we ask that you follow the music on the back. Uh, there, there may be mistaken the printed words, but the music in the back is correct. Amen.
gathered into one by the Spirit, we go in peace to serve the Creator. Seek God's boundless diversity in all you see and know that you are made in God's image. Thanks be to God. Our annual congregational meeting will start soon. Very, very soon.